Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Lee Cowden. He received his medical degree at the University of Texas Medical School at Houston. He is currently the chairman of the Scientific Advisory Board and professor of the Academy of Comprehensive Integrative Medicine. He's been a USA board certified cardiologist and internist and a licensed homeopathic medical doctor who is now retired from patient care and teaching full time. He's internationally known for his knowledge and skill in practicing and teaching integrative medicine. He's also co-authored seven books and has contributed to several other books and publications. Please welcome Dr. Cowden. I have three major topics to cover today in an hour, so hold on to your seats. <clears throat> Medical conditions resolved with non-invasive dental-related intervention. Uh, she gave me some, gave some of the background there. I, I want to stay on the last point there. I have no financial conflicts related to this uh, presentation. <clears throat> we have an amazing medical system in this country for certain things. Well, thank you. The U.S. has the best uh, acute trauma care in the world. U.S. trauma surgeons learn what they know from the battlefield surgeons. So if you have a broken bone or a uh, you know, gunshot wound or th things like that, don't go to the acupuncturist to get acupuncture and herbs. Uh, by all means, go to a trauma center. Or if you have a, you know, acute renal failure, get a hemodialysis. If you have lung failure, you know, get on a, a ventilator in ICU. A good integrative doctor will use all of these life-saving tools from allopathic medicine when indicated, but will use tools from other countries when those are better choices. So I am an integrative medicine doctor. An allopathic doctor hops through life on one foot, whether you're a dentist or a medical doctor. An alternative medicine doctor hops through life on the other foot, but a good integrative doctor walks through life on both feet or runs if they need to from the board. Is allopathic medicine safe? Medical error, according to the article there in the British Medical Journal, is the third leading cause of death in the United States. In, in 1976, when the LA doctors went on a strike, there was an 18% reduction in mortality. In this study of, in a university hospital, they found that iatrogenic, or doctor-caused, death was found in 2%. Now if you extrapolate that to the population of the United States, that would be 700,000 deaths per year. That's a scary number. Gary Noll and team found the same thing when they published their article in 2005. 783,000 deaths attributable to allopathic care just from what was extractable from the published literature. And Carolyn Dean found that by 2013 it had gone up to 1 million patients per year. So that's something from their article there. Look at that. It's $282 billion per year it costs the United States. Is allopathic medicine safe? In 1978, the Office of Technology Assessment, Division of the U.S. Government, determined that of all the things that are done in hospitals every day, only 10 to 20 percent have good scientific basis. In 1995, they repeated the study, and it was still only 10 to 20 percent. In 2011, two doctors reevaluated the data and found it was still 10 to 20 percent. Most allopathic doctors say, you know, everything we do in allopathic, me allopathic medicine has good scientific basis, but the research doesn't bear that out. Is the uh, allopathic medicine reproducible? Simulations show that for most study designs that, uh, that the conclusion is likely false. This is scary. In, in Nature Magazine, which is the mo most re uh, respected peer-reviewed journals in the world, they found that 67% of published pharmaceutical trials were not reproducible. And 89% of chemotherapy trials were not reproducible. There's a lot of retractions in the medical literature far exceeding the number of new journals. This is the important, important slide. We're, we need to follow evidence-based medicine, but what is it? It was defined very well in 1996 by three doctors from Oxford, one from the United States, and one from Canada. It has three components. One is the scientific literature, 
But the problem with the scientific literature is it doesn't necessarily always apply to the person that's sitting in front of you. Clinical experience, they said, is more important than the scientific literature. For example, I've treated many patients with cardiomyopathy over the years that were on the heart transplant list, and all of them, all but one of them, was reversed to the point where they got off the heart transplant list and continued to have a very happy, viable, functional life. So if I had recommended to the patients that had cardiomyopathy to get a heart transplant, I would be doing the patient a disservice because my clinical experience says there's a better way. Patient values, they said, trumps everything. Example, if a patient with Je who's a Jehovah's Witness comes into the emergency room with a hemoglobin of five and they're bleeding rectally, the, the ER doctor says, clinical experience says we must transfuse the patient. Medical literature says we must transfuse the patient. Does the patient get transfused? No. The patient decides what happens. Evidence-based medicine is not restricted to randomized trials and meta-analyses. The reason I put those slides in there is I want to encourage each of you to write up a case report and submit it to a journal. Uh, the organization I work with has a, an online journal. And I believe that there's still more value in a case report than there is in a meta-analysis. Because you learn things there that you might not have noticed otherwise. Okay, that's our journal there, acimresearch.org. So write, write that one down. I don't have it on any of the other slides. acimresearch.org. Okay, we're having a nationwide research project focused on reversing irreversible neurological conditions. So if you have any of those in your, in your practice, that would be a perfect candidate for doing a, a case report if you've had a turnaround in that patient's condition. Allopathic medicine acknowledges that they have very little to offer to patients that have advanced neurological disease. The James Connors there uh, charges $60 per hour to help a practitioner to write up a case report in a form that the journal will likely accept it. So that's, that's a nice thing for a busy practitioner. You might want to write her phone number down. I don't have anywhere else in the slides. This is how most of the health research is done. This is how it was done before the pharmaceutical industry convinced us to do it their way. But if these case reports are, enough of them come in, and we combine them together along with case series and compare that with meta-analyses to what's published in the peer-reviewed literature about a specific condition, we can actually prove that what we do in this room works better than what's being done presently in allopathic medicine. So that's the, that's the primary goal. There's now artificial intelligence multivariate analysis software that can tell you what you did that's most important if you have enough patient uh, case studies, enough patients to look at. This is a case report uh, from uh, 1991. 65-year-old man that came into the hospital with congestive heart failure and atrial fibrillation and frequent ventricular arrhythmia. He did not have a heart attack. Uh, muscle testing, which I did behind closed doors in the hospital, <laughs> uh, showed that, uh, that his uh, problem was coming primarily from a left lower third molar socket that was chronically infected. He had his wisdom teeth removed when he was 18. So this is 40 plus years later. And <clears throat> after, after giving him a little bit of allopathic care in the hospital to get him in good enough shape to get out of the hospital, I sent him to a biological dentist who's sitting in this audience. And <clears throat> that, uh, that dentist took, a, took an x-ray, didn't really find much on the x-ray, he said, but he said, Dr. Calvin says it's there, it's there, so I'm gonna go ahead and open it up and look. And he did, he says, the nastiest looking, nastiest smelling stuff they ever saw coming out of that uh, socket. He cleaned that socket out really well, and in a very short period of time after that, the atrial fibrillation, the ventricular arrhythmias, and the congestive heart failure went away, and he lived another 10 years without any heart disease. So this case helped me to understand better 
the body dental connection. Okay, and it's a shame that uh, most allopathic doctors don't understand the connection between the, the dentistry and the and the body. Uh, and a lot of people could be saved from a lot of pain and grief if if they did. And I'm I'm glad that I'm here in this audience because at least uh, most of the people in this audience understand that. But we need to get more of the doctors to understand the principle. Now since then I've had a lot of other patients with, with a similar story and cavitation oftentimes uh, resolved their condition whether it was cancer or arthritis or other severe conditions. Uh, but some patients couldn't afford the surgeries so I worked with an uh, Oriental medical doctor, who's also in this audience today, to develop a um, an herbal poultice to put in the patient's mouth, and we found that when you put this herbal poultice in the mouth against the problematic area and shined an infrared light through the cheek, through the gauze, into the bone, that it over time would clear up these areas enough to where the patient became asymptomatic. It's about two hours of gauze in the, in the mouth per day. It only takes about two minutes of light applied through the gauze, though. And it clears up, uh, you know, in my experience, uh, somewhere close to 80% of the, of the areas. I'd love to do a, a case series with the doctors in the audience, a case series using this principle. You know, you have the patient in the practice that can't afford the, uh, you know, the cavitational surgery. It'd be nice to be able to offer them something. We say, well... Are you willing for us to collect your data? And, uh, and if, if you have a good outcome, we'll, we'll you know, write that up as a case, case report, or if you're in a case series, you write it up. Okay, there's a Canadian dentist I told this to, and he said, that's fascinating. I have a bunch of patients in my practice that can't uh, afford the uh, cavitational surgery. So he did it, and he found that 80% of his uh, periodontal disease cleared over a six-month period and greater than 60% of the cavitations no longer caused the, pa the patient any problems. They found that the root canals had to be uh, redone uh, periodically because they just keep coming back and keep coming back. But I still, uh, and a lot of the doctors that I work with still uh, are using the oral health uh, product now here 20 years later and still getting you know, very good results. So I'd like to see it used on a larger basis and collect the data. That's the important thing, collect the data so we can know uh, from a scientific basis what it does. I've also seen that the uh, oral health stop uh, an abscess that was in progress and not have to do either an extraction or a root canal. So that's a, that's a nice little tool right there too. If you don't, you know, if you, if you put in a root canal, you know that you don't really save the tooth. The tooth doesn't come out, but, it, but it's dead after you, after you drill out the blood vessel and the nerve. But if you can keep it in their head with the blood vessel and the nerve, then that's a better deal than, than drilling out the blood vessel and the nerve. So there are some of the herbs that are in the uh, oral health. I'm not going to dwell on this slide because there's research articles for each of the uh, antimicrobial effects uh, in the herbal constituents. This is the type of infrared light I'm talking about. Very expensive. Off of Amazon, it's 20 bucks. Okay? It's called a 48 infrared LED. So if you go to Amazon, type in 48 infrared LED, and push search, it'll find this light. And I don't know why, but they sell the light separate from the power source. So you have to look on the page where the, where the light is found and find that power source to plug into it and buy both. Because if you just buy the light, you'll say, well, how am I supposed to use this? You can't. You see in the center of that light, it has a little black thing, and that's the photo sensor. So this light does not work in a room that has light coming in. You have to go into a darker room, and you'll be able to see very faint red lights coming out of those 48 infrared LEDs. Okay. Okay, so non-surgical resolution of pulpitis and osteitis of the jaw. Uh, again, it's the nine, it's the seven, seven Chinese herbs in the powder. You take a four by four cotton gauze, preferably cotton, cut it into four strips that are one inch wide by four inches long, and you put water up and down the strip, not soppy, but, but at least moist. Then you dump the oral health powder up and down the full length of the gauze, and then you fold that gauze upon itself, so now it's one half inch wide by four inches long, 
with the herb in between the two layers of the gauze. And then you pull the cheek out and you put that in the, in the buccal gutter, whether it's lower or upper, and leave it in there for two hours. The first few minutes it's in there, well, not immediately, but within, after it's been in there a couple of minutes, shine the infrared light that was on the previous slide through the cheek, through the gauze, into the bone, and it carries the energy of the herb into the bone. Okay? In addition, the infrared light stimulates the production of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide dilates blood vessels. The dilated blood vessels take up through the bloodstream in that area the herb that's been absorbed through the buccal mucosa into the bloodstream. So it's working from the outside in and the inside out. From the outside in, it's working energetically. From the inside out, it's working chemically. But, but it takes at least eight weeks, if you're going to do this, it takes at least eight weeks, in my experience, to, to calm down a, uh, an ositis. Dr. Ging, there's his phone number, is the one that uh, developed this with me back uh, 25 years ago. And <clears throat> as I said, he's here in the audience today. So write down his phone number if you're interested in uh, doing some more on this. I have no financial relationship. He's, he's, uh, he's been the person that made it and sell, sold it all these years. The, the, but, but even though the gauze has to stay in there two hours, the light is only used for about a minute per quadrant. So you, know, you don't use the light the entire two hours that the gauze is in the mouth. Not necessary. Okay. If, if, you find, if, you, if you do interject testing after the patients use this for about eight weeks, then you find that it's better interjectly but not resolved, then do it a few more weeks or go ahead and resort, resort to an invasive procedure. I find that if you treat the otic, sphenopalatine, and submandibular ganglia that are interjectly showing up to be filled up with toxins and, and not providing proper innervation to the jaw, that you increase the success of this treatment significantly. So in a few minutes, I'll show on a, on a, a volunteer from the audience where these injections would be done on the face to accomplish that. If you, if you don't do, if you don't desire to do invasive stuff at all, you can actually put the patient in a, on their back with their nose pointing up toward the ceiling and drop the, drop the procaine into their, into their nose and it'll be taken up by the mucosa of the nose and go into the sphenopalatine ganglia. So that's one that you don't, don't even have to inject. You probably don't feel uncomfortable injecting the submandibular because it's right there close to the things you're already injecting. The otic ganglia is usually injected uh, uh, here in front of the TMJ, and the depth is about one and a quarter inches. But that's German neural therapy I just described. It's also really helpful. Oral health is really helpful to resolve uh, periodontal disease. And you could do all the things that you usually do. You know, the ozone trays or the uh, you know other uh, ther therapies like that. But you can do this in addition and get faster and better results. And uh, if you can, try to identify and resolve the emotions that are connected to the site in the mouth where the problem is. On the next slide, you'll see uh, where some of the emotions are located. So a, a part of this slide was taken from uh, something published by uh, Dietrich Klinghardt and Dr. Gladish from Germany. But you see on the far right column, the column that I added, the emotions that are attached to each tooth. So if you know which tooth is involved, then you know which motion is likely involved. And if you know which emotion is involved, then you try to help them resolve that emotion. There's a variety of methods to do that. My, uh, my favorite method is uh, Evox therapy. With Evox, uh, it's a software in a computer, and the computer has attached to it by USB port an apparatus like this that I have on my head right now. And the patient speaks into a microphone. The microphone is recording the frequencies in their voice, not the words themselves, but the frequencies in their voice. And after recording their voice while they're imagining a person or an event for just 15 seconds, you see displayed on the computer screen all the emotions and all events that are attached to that person or that event with about a 95% predictive accuracy. And then the device converts those 
frequencies that are coming out of the voice into a homeopathic-like energy that it delivers back to the patient through a hand electrode while they're listening to pleasant instrumental music. And I find that uh, you can resolve most, for most patients, most emotions that affect their dental health, health and their health in general with about three sessions. One for mom, one for dad, and one for the most other significant person in their life. And there's usually uh, a uh, session with a, uh, a traumatic event, which can sometimes be done along with mom or dad or that other person. You see on this slide that if they have a problem in their canine, that that's an, an unresolved anger issue. But you see it affects the, the hip and the knee and the gallbladder. So if a patient has hip pain and knee pain and periodic gallbladder pain, you know that they're likely going to develop a problem in one of their canines if it goes on long enough. I found tremendous truth in the work of Western Price, George Mining, who wrote cover, Root Canal Cover-Up, and uh, Jill Beverly who, who wrote a book about recall healing. Recall healing is asking the right question the right way so if the patient has an aha moment and they quickly resolve the emotion that's attached to a dental problem or a physical uh, problem in the, in the body. So this is the upper, upper jaw here, or the, uh, the, the, the maxilla. The, the third molar is associated with feelings of inadequacy. Uh, in my experience, 95% of all medical doctors, osteopathic doctors, and dentists have this emotion to varying degrees. So it's a common emotion in practitioners. But just think about it for a minute. Who would put themselves through the torment of going through four plus years of, of training the way it's done unless they had a powerful need to try to please somebody? Right? <clears throat> so anyway, once the, once the third molar area becomes involved, usually the retromolar area also becomes involved soon after that because most people sleep uh, on their back and uh, the, the organic acids that are produced in the third molar socket after a wisdom tooth is taken out uh, start etching away into the, into the calcium in the back wall of that socket and finally erode into the marrow space, which is the retromolar area. And then uh, all kinds of emotions are found in that area. Dr. Gledish, who, who, who did some of this uh, work on this slide, uh, has spent his entire dental career doing acupuncture in the retromolar area. That's a very special, you know, specialty. Okay, so uh, consider uh, contact, uh, the um, computerized regulation thermography, which I'm going to show next, uh, electrodermal screening, uh, cavitat or cone beam, or some other modality to verify these things. Muscle testing will tell you where it is, but the problem is that you want to be pretty darn sure that you know what you're talking about, and there's a saying in ancient Hebrew tradition that if one person said it so, it might be so. If two people said it so, it's probably so. If three people said it so, it's so. So if you get a muscle test that says one thing, and without knowing the results of the muscle test, somebody else does, uh, let's say, uh, electrodermal screening, and they get the same result, and then you do one of these other, uh, one of the conventional tests, the uh, thermography or the cavitat, cone beam, you see it there also, then that's three people saying it's so. So it's almost certainly so. Even if you can't find it on your x-rays or on your, uh, your panorex. Okay, so this, this is the, uh, for, for dental, this is the type of uh, thermal imaging that I prefer. This is not done with, a, with an infrared camera. This is done with a thermo, uh, basically a high, highly sensitive thermometer. And <clears throat> so the, the technician measures 200 points on the body then exposes the body to a cooler temperature and then measures those 200 points again. And you're looking at the change and the difference between those two tests. You know, so you can learn a whole lot about the body. You see, oh here, let me put that up. So you see that uh, with just diet, I, I, I swipe this slide in the next one from Dr. Gracia who's in the audience. And you see from this, uh, this slide with just, just dietary therapy that many of the red red bars on the bottom graphic went away after some time, only ones that didn't go away with global immune system stress and lymph block. The most lymph congesting of all foods is dairy 
any type of dairy, cow, goat, sheep, mule, horse, whatever. And the second most uh, lymph congesting of all foods is any kind of gluten grain. So if you want to have success with your patients, uh, whether they're medical patients or dental patients, get them off the dairy and get them off the gluten because it's going to clog up their lymphatic system. They can't drain toxins away from the tissues if the lymphatic system is clogged up. So this is, <clears throat> this is the close-up view of the imaging of the, of the uh, maxilla and ma mandible with the uh, thermometry. And if the, if the, as I said, if the electrodermal screening confirms this or the uh, muscle testing confirms this, then you have two people saying it's so. So it's probably so. But anyway, again, neural therapy of the facial ganglia is important. I'll, sh I'll show you that in a few moments. Uh, you know, what that looks like uh, uh, from a practical perspective. The background on neural therapy is fascinating. started in 1906 with uh, a doctor uh, figuring out that there was a, a ability to resolve a lot of physical conditions just by giving them a procaine injection. So you know the body clears the procaine within an hour or so, uh, but the effects for the neural therapy can last for weeks or months or years. So uh, what's, what's happening with neural therapy is that you, re, you repolarize the depolarized cells that are causing a symptom. Uh, very commonly, the symptom is pain. And when you repolarize the cell, the patient's uh, threshold for pain is changed by the injection of the local anesthetic. The Hunnicker brothers were the ones that really brought it to uh, the, the forefront in, in Germany and published this book back in 20, 1928. Now there's several thousand European doctors who do the neural therapy on a regular basis, and there's quite a few doctors in the United States. In my opinion, uh, any medical doctor, osteopathic doctor, or, or dentist needs to know how to do some neural therapy because it's a valuable tool. The type of neural therapy that's most commonly done in the United States was the trigger point injection, which was popularized by Dr. Janet Trevell. But there's lots more to neural therapy than trigger point injection. And there's considerable research that's been published, but it's mostly in German and Spanish. And so if you read one of those languages, then you can go search it out. Well, I guess now with Google Translate, anybody in the audience can check it out, right? So for, for dentistry, the most important ganglia to check out by muscle testing or some other means and to inject are the sphenopalatines, submandibular, and uh, otic. But, but if the vagus is messed up, you can also do neural therapy on the vagus. That's uh, right, below, right behind the earlobe and about inch and a half, inch and a quarter, inch and a half deep. And if you do the vagus, never do the vagus on both sides the same day. I learned that lesson the hard way. Only one vagus one day and then a different day the other vagus. Because otherwise you can put them into hypotensive hop, crisis. If you add a little bit of uh, injectable DMPS or DMSA, uh, you improve the success of the neural therapy usually because the DMSA DMPS helps to bind up the metals that are in the ganglia that are often ca causing it to malfunction in the first place. And you can get, you can get a custom compounding pharmacy to, to make up either one of those. Uh, the DMSA is difficult to get into solution. You have to dissolve it with 100% sodium hydroxide, and once you get it dissolved, you start adding hydrochloric acid back to it until it just starts to precipitate a little bit, then you add another drop of hot sodium hydroxide, and that's the solution that you inject. So it's pretty alkaline, it's about pH of 10, but as long as you put it with a little bit of uh, uh, procaine, it doesn't, uh, doesn't precipitate in the tissues. So there's uh, one reference site for the, uh, for the neural therapy. <clears throat> and that was in English, by the way. That's good. Okay, heavy metal testing. Um, I don't know how many people in the audience use OligoScan, but I find that to be a useful tool to have in the office. So in 10 seconds' time, with a photometric non-invasive device that you take measurements on the hand, you can get a pretty good idea what the heavy metal load is and which type of heavy metal is the most problematic and also what the therapeutic minerals are. If a person is low in therapeutic minerals, they're going to be more susceptible to holding on to permanently the heavy metals in their body because the, the, the body uh, uh, pushes heavy metals out when you take therapeutic minerals. If you don't have enough, the heavy metals reside, remain. Okay, uh, glutath glutathione is um, you know, made by the body. 
uh, and it carries the metals through the kidneys, into the urinary bladder, into the toilet, or through the liver and the gallbladder and the, and the gut, and finally into the toilet. But the problem in the gut is the bacteria oftentimes break down the glutathione and heavy metal bond, and so you have to have some kind of binder in the gut to keep it from getting uh, reabsorbed out of the gut into the bloodstream. The ones I use the most are uh, cracked chlorella and also um, modified citrus pectin. But th there's a variety of other fibers that will do a pretty good job at binding metals. Uh, the, the glutathione is made from glutamate, cysteine, and, and uh, glycine, which are all three non-essential amino acids. And the rate-limiting step used to be cysteine. So you can't give cysteine in the gut because cysteine in the gut, two cysteine molecules combine together to form cysteine, and it's not usable by the body. So you have to give N-acetylcysteine to, to prevent the cysteine that you're taking in from being converted by stomach acid into cysteine. But nowadays, with so much glyphosate in the air, we're, we're ha seeing oftentimes patients who are having to take glycine as a supplement to have enough glycine in their body to make glutathione. So be aware of that. Uh, last year, there was over a billion pounds of, gly of, of glyphosate or Roundup sprayed in the air in the United States. And if it rained, there was a 70% chance there was Roundup in the rain that came down on the organic crops. So unless you're growing your organic crop under a greenhouse with air intakes on the green charcoal air intakes on the greenhouse, you don't have organic. You just think you have organic. Okay, and there's a couple of other products. Liposomal glutathione, there's somebody out here selling liposomal glutathione. And then there's S-acetyl glutathione, which is a pill that you can take that to, uh, you know, take up the glutathione. Glutathione is broken down in the stomach by stomach acid and, and pepsin. So you can't uh, do that. You can do sublingual glutathione, but if you do sublingual glutathione very long by itself, it's going to burn the bottom side of the tongue. So always put a puddle of water under the tongue before you add the glutathione powder to it. Cilantro tincture is excellent at getting uh, across the blood-brain barrier, binding metals and pulling the metals out of the brain. So there's some of the uh, metal binders that I use, all oral, DMSA, DMPS, NBMI. If you don't know NBMI, you need to learn about NBI, NBMI. That's the uh, invention of Dr. Boyd Haley, and uh, they're working on uh, research now to get it back in the United States. It was in the United States in 2005, but uh, FDA took it out of the United States, so now we have to do all this research to get it back in the United States. Uh, he's, been, he's doing that research in Ireland, and Ireland's called the Emerald Isle, and that's why the product's called Emeramide. Oh, by the way, if you add DMSO to any of those, it'll get across the blood-brain barrier better. Okay, so liposomal EDTI, I find, is better for lead binding than those uh, just listed. And uh, everybody needs to learn about Herbalix uh, detox deodorant. Uh, the company that makes that decided they didn't want to go through lots of FDA stuff, so they called their product a deodorant. You can either uh, put it in your axilla, or you can put it on the soles of your feet. But the, but the product draws aluminum to it. It's, it's a very powerful aluminum uh, binder. If you do uh, heavy metal challenge testing or the, the oligo scan that I mentioned, you'll, you'll find that 95% of the time the, that most elevated heavy metal in the body is aluminum. And there's a variety of reasons. You know, people are still using uh, aluminum antiperspirants. They're still cooking uh, food in aluminum pots. They're still brushing their teeth with the standard toothpaste that have uh, aluminum hydroxide, also called bauxite. So you've got to switch your patients from whatever toothpaste they're doing to something that doesn't have bauxite in it. But, the, but probably the number one source of aluminum now is the chemtrails that are being sprayed on us every day. And so how are you going to get rid of that, right? But so we need to be continually trying to get aluminum out of the body using the detox deodorant. You apply it to the soles of the feet, probably in the beginning, not every night, you know, rotate nights, do one night on, one night off. And uh, because it'll sometimes store up so much heavy metal that it makes the patient feel sick. But aluminum uh, impairs the function of the lymphatic system and decreases intracellular magnesium and potassium. That's a big problem because 50% uh, of the metabolic enzymes in the body require magnesium as a cofactor. Cracked chlorella, again, in modified citrus pectin, help to bind the uh, stuff in the gut. 
and then replacing the deficient minerals. So if you do the oligo scan, you know which, deficient, which minerals are deficient in 10 seconds, then you can give them the supplement nutrient orally to replace that. Okay, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the bite takes precedence over all other joints of the body in my experience. So what I found is that if the patient was out of alignment in a joint, when I sent them to the dentist to have their bite adjusted, that other joint re remained out of alignment or kept going out of alignment no matter how many times they went to the chiropractor or the osteopath. And, and that's just not a good thing. So in my opinion, a wise biological dentist would work closely with somebody that can help them get the entire body aligned. In the next few minutes of the presentation, I'm going to try to show you how to do that in your office without violating the uh, Dental Practice Act. <laughs> So what I did after that is I make sure the patient had every joint in their body adjusted properly by interject testing, and then I would send them with a, a cotton gauze in between their, their premolars over to the dentist's office, and the dentist's office would adjust their bite while they were still in alignment of all those other joints. And then usually after that, all the other joints held in, in proper alignment. I also taught the patients how to do their own self-adjustment techniques, which I'm going to teach you today. And if the, if the patient, if you have a massage table like this in your office and you say to the patient, that's yours to use, I don't do anything with it <laughs> as a dentist. You say, you can, you can lay down there and fix yourself, but I can't touch you while you're on there because I might be uh, violating my Dental Practice Act. Uh, but the patients that have been trained know how to do this and they can actually get, it, get most of their joints adjusted uh, without having the assistance of anybody in the, in the dental office. If you have a, a, a massage therapist, a body worker of any type in your office, a chiropractor next door, osteopath next door, then get them to do it. That's fine. But if, if the, if the, person, the uh, body worker that you work with is clear across town, it's not as good as, as trying to do something in your own office. And there's quite a bit of science behind, uh, behind this principle of, of getting the joints aligned before you get the bite aligned. Um, the word doctor, by the way, comes from the, from the Latin word docere, which means to teach. So everybody in the audience, whether you like it or not, is a teacher, primarily. You know, everything else you do is superfluous, really. And so learn how to teach your patients what we're going to learn today. Here's all the symptoms. You, you, a lot of people in the audience know that all this stuff, all the uh, symptoms that come with uh, you know, uh, malocclusion or temporal mandibular joint disease. But I just pointed out, you know, that neck aches, shoulder and cervical pain, paresthesia of the hands and fingers, torticollis, and postural problems are all part of the structural stuff that happens when the bite is not adjusted, adjusted when the patient's fully adjusted first. This is a, a, a slide out of, or a picture out of one of Dr. Uh, Clayton Chan's articles in uh, Dental Asia. You see on the right there, the, the patient has terrible uh, structural alignment, but when you do the structural work and then do the dental work, then the patient is able to maintain a good posture. That's a good thing. So mis dental misalignments will lead to head and neck posture compensation, which affect the lower back and contribute to structural diseases. That's a quote out of his article. These first four references are all from Dr. Chan, uh, and there may be somebody that does better work than he does, but I, I wasn't able to find it when I was searching for that in the past. The, the, the fifth article there is uh, scoliosis and dental occlusion relationships and from the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, it's a review. It's in the scoliosis journal. And then the next one was uh, showing universal, uni sorry, unilateral crossbite in children with asymmetry of the upper cervical spine. And then the next article after that was actually published in our at our academy's journal. I oh, no, no, I guess it was this, that, that doctor published one in our journal, but the, this particular article was published in, uh, in the Journal of Cranial Mandibular uh, Sleep Practice. But he showed, you know, that, that you, that you'll have, you, you can fix a patient either by putting shims in their feet, under their feet, which helps the structure, or fixing the other structure and then fixing the bite. Uh, but if you don't do all of that, 
you're going to keep having to do something on a regular basis. The next one is a, uh, uh, a book where, you talk, where it talks about skull and spine alignment uh, relation to dental occlusion. 1100 page book with lots of references. And the last one is an is a, is a animal study. I thought this one was fascinating. They, they took 15 rats and they put a, 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 a composite resin on the first molar on the right side of the rat's mouth and then watched them and took x-rays uh, after a week and they found that all of them had developed scoliosis, all 15. And then they put a uh, occlusive surface on the opposite molar to balance that out and 83% of them, the scoliosis resolved. The other 70%, they didn't get the bite just right for the rat. The rats can't tell you, oh, that didn't feel right. <laughs> Okay, so these are some of the important steps toward uh, bite adjustment. Uh, have the patient do a stress reduction technique. So if you have something in your hands right now, put it down. Do that with your left hand, left thumb touching a left index. Wrap your right hand around it, lay it in your lap. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Hold it for one second, out through the mouth. Keep breathing like that, in through the nose, hold for one second, out through the mouth. As you close your eyes, you visualize yourself in the most relaxing vacation place that you can remember. And you want to remember that place with all of your senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. Now, if you do that, you're going to entrain your entire brain in the pleasant memory of that vacation place. And <clears throat> after doing this for four minutes, you'll shift from sympathetic in excess to parasympathetic in slight excess after you've practiced it for a while, maybe not the first time you do it, but after some time, usually about uh, two to four weeks, you'll see that the parasympathetic finally exceeds the sympathetic. So they, if you do that before a meal, you're going to improve your digestive juices, your ability to digest, your ability to absorb. Uh, it's going to improve your immune function. If you do it for, before bedtime, you're going to improve your ability, how fast you fall asleep, how deeply you sleep, and how much healing you get while you sleep. Uh, so four minutes before every meal, four minutes before every bedtime, 16 minutes a day. A lot of people say, well, I don't have 16 minutes a day. I can do that. And I say, okay, here's what you do. Commit to doing it, even though you don't have the time to do it, for one month. At the end of one month, you'll find that you can sleep 30 minutes less per night and still feel just as rested. So you're investing 16 minutes a day. You're getting out 30 minutes a day. You have extra 14 minutes a day. Can you think of something you could do with an extra 14 minutes a day? Right? So, got to sell on the, on the benefits of the program. Okay, teach the patient self-adjustment techniques, which we're going to do in a moment with our volunteer. Uh, have the patient do visualization, shouting, and forgiving. Okay, this is the way that looks. The patient goes by themselves someplace where they're not going to be disturbed and they're, and, and they're not going to disturb anyone else. They close their eyes. They see the face of somebody that they're not related to in the past that caused them pain and anger. Uh, and once they can see that person's face, they shout at them as if they're there. The patient's not, the, the person's not there, obviously. Uh, but they shout at them as if they're there, and they keep shouting until there's nothing else to shout. Sometimes in the process of shouting, uh, certain other emotions bubble up, like sadness over the damage of the relationship or fear about that happening again or whatever. But don't, the patient should not push down any of those other emotions. Just let each emotion come out as they come out. After they shouted at the first person, they shout the next, the next, the next, go up through the distant relatives and the closest relatives, including the parents, the parents of the next to the last that you do, and the very last that you do is yourself. Now, when you shout at yourself, you're going to see yourself look, looking at yourself in a mirror at the youngest age where you were angry at yourself for doing something, saying something, failing to do, failing to say something. And when you see yourself at that age, you shout at yourself whatever you were angry at yourself about at that age. Then you see yourself a little older, a little older, a little older, all the way up to present age. When you finally finish shouting at everybody, then you go back through and start forgiving. You forgive yourself first, then you forgive your parents next, and you forgive your spouse, significant other, all the way back to the first person you shouted at. So that's visualization, shouting, and forgiving. If you're a praying person, you can do a prayer at the end of that. You know, God, I'm sorry for the anger and frustration I've had towards myself and these others. Please forgive me for that. Please remove the roots of the anger and frustration from me, both consciously and subconsciously. Okay, but, the, but the, the, you'll see in a minute, I think, 
why the, uh, the, the shouting forgiving is, is so important. Uh, it, affects the, it affects the gallbladder meridian always. The gallbladder meridian, as I said earlier, affects the canine tooth, but it also affects the first and second cervical vertebra structure. And so if a person's out of alignment in the, in the first and second cervical structure, then every other joint below that is going to be out of alignment uh, to varying degrees. Okay, muscle tests uh, for dysfunction of the facial ganglia and do neural therapy if needed. Have patients do stress reduction techniques in your dental office before you do anything else with them. Eyes closed, visualizing. If they've already done that for a couple of weeks, then they'll have a practice at that. Um, if the patient's muscles of mastication are tender, then soften them up with a little bit of electromagnetic therapy. A TENS unit or a, a doctor, uh, one of the bio biomodulators from Dr. Tennant and so on. Whatever, whatever you have in your office to do to soften muscles. And then if you want to do a test, that's a good time to do a test. You know, if you want to look at their EMG to see what, uh, what, what's, you know, what's uh, being affected by the off, bite being off, then you do that at that point. <clears throat> then you have the patient do the self-adjustment techniques. And then the doctor assists the patient, you, oftentimes with the adjustment of the skull and the temporal mandibular joint, which I'm going to show you in a moment. And when, the, uh, when adjusting the bite, the, uh, you muscle test the patient as you're doing the bite adjustment until the patient's muscle testing shows that it's finished. And um, maybe there'll be time for that, I don't know. Uh, then, then you muscle test the patient sitting, standing, with head in various positions. You know, turn right, turn left, far back, far forward, head to the side, head, uh, head to the other side. And you want to have them Open mouth and close, close mouth, yeah. Okay, so retest the EMG after that. Now this, oh, yeah, th this is the uh, upper two spine. Uh, these, these, are the, these are the things you go through, so we're going to show that on a, on a volunteer right now. And then these, it's good to have this in your office, a, a picture of this so that you can remember where all the sutures are that you want to be working on if you're going to do this yourself or teach the patient how to do it. Okay, and this is the same slide again. Uh, by the way, uh, an hour is not very long to teach what I wanted to teach. Uh, so you, the, a lot of the stuff I'm teaching is, is somewhere on our website, acimconnect.com. Uh, so Pam, where are you? Here, come on. Okay, do you have a camera to, to look at this? Yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> the, the first thing that Pam is going to do, oh, you got the necklace on still. Yeah. Metal around the neck usually blocks everybody's energy. It's fine to have a, uh, a pendant, but not the metal that goes all the way around the neck. Switch that to silk, braided silk, nylon, braided nylon, you have a pocket? Yeah, she does. Uh, but something non-metallic, so it doesn't block the energy flow through the body. Don't wear metal, metal bracelets or metal watch bands. Don't wear rings on the finger any more than you have to. Uh, so all those things are blocking the energy. Right. Yeah, so at least stand back just a hair there. It's a geopathic over here. Okay, so we're just going to see if, the, if Pam has energy flowing through her body. We're going to use a deltoid type of testing. Uh, resist now. Okay, resist again. Okay, so she was trying just as hard the second time as the first time. I'm pretty sure it looked like she was, or maybe harder. <laughs> uh, but all I did is I put the center of the palm of my hand over the center of her belly button. Now, there, there's radial artery here, ulnar artery there. Palmer and astomosis already going across here. The, one of those is usually stronger than the other. In this case, in my case, it's radial is stronger than ulnar. So the blood flows this way through my hand in a clockwise fashion. And around her belly button, there's a, a, a nest of vessels that also have blood flowing in a, in a, in a circular fashion. And when you do this, it's like putting two magnets of the same type together, creating the, the stress and the resistance of the system. 
Okay, so now, what we want to do is keep your teeth apart just a little bit so we can just run down through this quickly and see where you're out of alignment. Resist. Yeah, a little bit there, not too bad. Okay, mid-thoracic, upper, th upper cervical, mid-thoracic. Okay, lumbar area. Left SI joint. Left hip. You know, we could, we're, gonna, we're running out of time, so I wanted to kind of abbreviate this a little bit. But uh, I want to show her, which she can then show to others, how to fix the cervical spine and the thoracic spine and the hips and pelvis. Okay? Good start, right? All right, so uh, first thing I want you to do is to reach toward the ceiling and the floor at the same time with opposite arms. And just stretch as hard as you can, like that, yeah. And then reach like this, the other one, as hard as you can. Uh -huh. And then backwards and forwards at the same time, as hard as you can. And backwards and forwards as hard as you can. So that, what she just did, will adjust usually fairly well, the T, T1 through T3 or 4. And <clears throat> the, the next one she's going to do is what's called, what I call windmill twist. So I'm going to stand a little bit away from you so I don't hit you. But it's like this. And every time you come around, you look as far back that way as you can. No, and you're, 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 scarecrow, you're, you're a tin man. You've got to be scarecrow. Scarecrow means the arms are fluid. Yeah, yeah. Look, look behind you every time. Yeah. That, that helps to adjust the, the rest of the thoracic spine. Okay, let's, yeah, that's good. And then the, the, the next, next place that we try to adjust is the, yeah, it feels better. So, oh, here. Is this somebody's water? Oh, that's my water. Okay, so if she lays down on the table here, uh, head down there, on your back, on your back. Okay, so, so now we, we said that the, that the uh, left SI was out. I'm just going to show you on the right side first how, how she would do this. Now, again, the, the dentists don't have to touch the patient. They can just say, they can lay down on the table themselves, say, this is how I would do it if I was going to do it on me, and then have the patient mimic that. So she's going to put her hands on top of her knee and she's going to tug her knee toward her axilla on the same side as far as it'll go. Keep breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. There you go. And then at some point, when you feel like it won't go any further, you grab the heel here, you pull it toward this shoulder and push this knee away like that. And then you kick out. You do the same thing over here. Toward the axilla, toward the axilla, Take it down, take it down, it won't go any further. Keep breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. It won't relax if you're not breathing. And then hold here, pull it toward this shoulder, push this, no, yeah, don't, no, keep your head straight. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, wait, 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 right here. There you go. And push that one away. Now you see right there, there's a 90 degree angle between here and the middle line of her body. That means this hip is adjusted. If it only gets to there, it's not adjusted. She has to go to there. And then she kicks out. Okay, now she's going to adjust this SI joint by doing this. Hand behind the knee, hip under the midline of the body, scoot it that way just a hair, there you go. And then she'll hold on with her hand up here so their upper body won't turn. Got yeah, anything to reach? I no, can't reach it. Oh, that was there. That'll work. So keep the upper body from turning and just let this, this, this leg needs to be relaxed from the knee down. But, but, uh, Lean it over the edge of the bed. Keep breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out until it won't go any further. The first time somebody does this, it's good for their, their spouse, their significant other, to help them do this, uh, to, to stretch those muscles. Once they've done it a time or two, they don't need the help. They can do it by themselves. Hey, okay, keep... You keep uh, letting the leg go down until it won't go any further with the, with the breathing out. But she's already gone down at least a foot and a half. That's pretty good. And then you stretch the leg out that way and back. If she came over this way and went back that way, it would cause the joint to go back out of alignment. If she comes over this way and out like that and back, the, the joint will stay adjusted. Do the same thing here. 
make sure you're not going to go off the edge of the table there. Okay, so you're going to take, take you know, keep that lower leg relaxed. If, if this is tight here, this will be tight here too. Okay, deep breath in, deep breath out, deep breath in, breath out. Okay, don't want to go any further. Keeps on going down, see that? You're doing well, doing well. <laughs> Year, years ago, I had a 55-year-old man on the table. I was doing this to him. He said, Doc, I'll pay you extra if you'll stop doing that. <laughs> All right, this went back. Okay. Now, the last step is I call it the, the bucket list. You can do this with a, with a soccer ball or, or, or a cheap $1 ball from a store that's, 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 you know, that's about the size of a soccer ball, but you're going to bring this close to your body like that, squeeze the squeeze the bucket really tightly, and you're going to go that way as fast as you can without letting the bucket go. you got to hold the bucket really tight between your legs. Squeeze and stretch. Like that. You did it. First time. I'm amazed. Most people don't get that right the first time. <laughs> That's impressive. So now you can sit up on the edge. There. But those, those are the most important joints to fix besides the neck. Hold up again. Now resist. Again. Yeah, it's still open. Okay, let's see if this is in. Oh my, that's nice. Okay, now I just touched her left hip and her left SI, which was out before, and it's not out anymore. She fixed the mid thoracic also by twisting. Okay, cervical still out. So we're just going to lay back down for a minute. Ooh, almost went off the edge. <clears throat> now, if she closes her eyes, and usually you have the person think of their spouse. You know, we don't marry our twin, we marry our opposite, right? And we get frustrated with our, uh, the spouse that's our opposite. And so we get, uh, but before we go to sleep, we need to be doing this every night. So, so see, his, see his face, uh, say, I, I forgive you both consciously and sub subconsciously for everything that you've done or failed to do, said or failed to say that has caused any anger, frustration, or pain in me or anyone else that I care about. Okay? Yeah, so what I want you to do next, and, and by the way, you can do this and feel which side is roped up. If you're roped up on the right side, that's a male unforgiveness. If it's roped up on the left side, it's a female unforgiveness, so that way you know where to go next. But she's going to put her hand on the side of her face like this. And she's going to turn her neck as far as it'll go that way with her hand, not with her neck. Her neck is relaxed. Good. And we won't go any further. She lets it go. Holds it for about 10 seconds and lets it go and back to the neutral. And the same thing this way. Hold that way. Hold for a 10 count. Back to the neutral. Now sit up again. Okay, resist. Good job. Okay, now let's show you the neural therapy. Looks like a needle, doesn't it? Kind of. Okay, so. <clears throat> oh, let's do it on that side first. Since the camera's over there. No, 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 that, that, right there. You're perfect. So, so the so the sphenopalatine is right here above the zygomatic arch, at that angle. It's about an inch and quarter deep. So you're going to go right under the right above the zygomatic arch, right under the bone that's, that's, that's behind that. If you're going this way, you're at the bone. So about that angle. The otic ganglia is perfectly horizontal to the floor if the patient's sitting. So you find the TMJ, you find the soft spot in the cheek, right in front of the TMJ, right below that bone, and you go straight in there, inch and a quarter. If you're doing submandibular, you run your, th your finger from the uh, the angle of the jaw forward until you find an indentation, and that indentation is where the where the submandibular ganglia is located. Okay, so sphenopalatine, otic, submandibular. If any of those are weak, you can do it by muscle testing. That one is, and yeah, that one is. So, so she's got some toxins in those. So, if she was going to you know, get her uh, jaw adjusted, it would be best to fix that first. I won't show it on both sides. Okay, so 
that's kind of a whirlwind tour through the uh, the process. Do you, do you oh, we didn't we didn't do your, your skull adjustment. I'll show you that. That takes another minute. Can you have one more minute or not? Yep. Out of time. You're good. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So let's sit over there in the chair. Oh, just you know, like that. Okay. Uh, if you if you look at your skull that we had up there earlier, the multicolored skull, the the place you want to oh try, do, do this first. Uh, yeah, probably have to even turn it further if the camera's going to see it. There we go. So <clears throat> you you find the mastoid process. You find the little uh, groove right behind the mastoid process, which is that suture that we showed on the screen, and right behind that's the occipital bone. So you want to be on the occipital bone to do part of this. And I usually uh, you know, brace the patient's head so you don't mess up their neck in the process of fixing their head. So you're going to initially push that direction forward on the, on the mastoid process. So take a deep breath in, breath out, like that. And then on the, on the occipital bone, press in and take, take a deep breath. Now, this one you press in and up. Another breath, another breath. That one hurts, right? <laughs> Not too bad? Okay, I'm going to press. And you do the same thing on the other side. And then <clears throat> you, you go from, from these, these places that you just uh, opened up, up the suture, the lambdoid suture here, between the occipital bone and the parietal bone, and you're doing this type of motion. This type of motion on each side of the suture as you go up. So it looks like that. I'm exaggerating it, but you see the, you see the concept. This, these are interdigitated sutures, and so they're like that. And if you push down on one side, it pops the other one up. If you push down on this side, it pops the other one up. So once it's going like this, it'll go like this. So you do that on both sides, and then you go on the coronal suture, on the sagittal suture first, all the way up to the coronal suture, like that. And on the coronal suture, you just run up the forehead until you find a little indentation. That's the suture. Now we do that on both sides. And then we stretch the, uh, the sutures across here, uh, the, the temporal suture. The temporal suture is a sliding suture like this. So the way you fix that is push down on the zygomatic arch and pull back on the occiput at the same time at the same time. That's that direction of force. And then this one is pushing down on the zygomatic arch back there close to the ear and pulling up on the forehead at the same time. I call that expanding the temporal X. So we just did that to, the, to, the, to that area. Do the same thing on the other side. The last step is to put your uh, hand in the mouth with gloves on and twist the jaw down on one side the maxilla down on one side, twist the maxilla down on the other side. Once you've done all of that, then you muscle test for the, TM, for the TMJ. Not too bad. Yeah, those are okay. If the TMJ is out of alignment, it's usually uh, mandible pushed medially compared to the joint. So the way that you fix that is you hook your fingers under the mandible, and you put to this part of your uh, feeder eminence of the, of the thumb up against the, the uh, patient's zygomatic arch. And you have the patient take, keep their teeth about maybe a quarter inch apart. They take a deep breath in, and as they're breathing out, you do this, this type of motion, okay? Which then causes the mandible to move outward. But don't do that on a patient if they're not out of alignment. You'll push, you know, put them out of alignment. So you can always muscle test to see if this needs to be done. Okay, I think we're out of time.